Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can discuss the concept of blame shifting in the context of cluster B personality disorders. So this would include antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic personality disorders. Now blame shifting is a failure to take responsibility and deflecting responsibility. We could think of it as a cognitive distortion, and we can also think about it as a type of manipulation. And it's a type of manipulation we can see really with all of the cluster B personality disorders. So as I mentioned, at the core of blame shifting, we have this failure to take responsibility. It could also be considered an unwillingness or an inability to take responsibility, or a refusal based on someone's interpretation of evidence. And of course, that interpretation could be distorted. So if I use borderline personality disorder as an example, say you're working with a heterosexual couple, and let's say that the woman in the couple has borderline personality disorder, and she's manifesting symptoms like frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, inappropriate intense anger, and paranoia, and these behaviors, these symptoms, are causing relational difficulties. So in a situation like this, she could be shifting the blame over to her partner. Now, the evidence could be that he's going out with friends, staying out late, texting a lot, and the woman in the relationship could be thinking, well, this means he's cheating. But there could actually be very good reasons why he's engaging in those behaviors. And maybe when weighing that evidence, it's clear that he's not cheating, or it's unlikely. So by directly challenging the blame shifting in a scenario like this, you're going to end up in a stalemate some of the time. So direct challenging can just lead to somebody continuing with the blame shifting because of their interpretation of the evidence, which of course you can contest, but you can't ultimately prove that their interpretation is incorrect. So to take an example from antisocial personality disorder, say that somebody's caught with heroin or cocaine or some other drug that's clearly illegal, and they deny criminal responsibility because they say the action should not have been a crime in the first place. And they have all these reasons why the drug should never have been criminalized or should be decriminalized. So again, you end up in a stalemate. If you challenge that, the individual could just throw that back at you, and again, you're in a stalemate, or they could sidestep the issue. But either way, directly challenging that distortion may not be successful. So when working with blame shifting, if direct confrontation is part of the modality you're using and direct confrontation doesn't work, how do you confront distortions? Well, I think one important element would be you don't necessarily have to get involved in the details. So if we use the example of drug possession, you don't have to get into why it really should be a crime, how destructive drugs are, and all these other societal issues around drugs. Again, this just ends up with you going in circles and you end up really in a stalemate. Also, where there's one distortion, oftentimes there are more distortions. So even in therapy, if you can somehow prove that a drug should be illegal, there'll just be another distortion waiting right behind that. So you end up in a situation where you're just chasing down distortions and trying to confront them on that level, trying to get into the legality of drugs and drug possession and drug use and all of that. It just ends up being oftentimes, I think, a non-productive route. So another way to confront distortions like blame shifting is to help the individual see the pattern of the distortions. So you don't necessarily contest or challenge any particular distortion, but you point out the theme that you see over time. And in theory, once the pattern is recognized by that individual, the distortions will be reevaluated in light of that new pattern. That's the idea anyway. What we know about treating cluster B personality disorders is that this oftentimes doesn't happen. This strategy doesn't necessarily work either. And this is frustrating for clients, and it's frustrating for clinicians. So why does this strategy sometimes fail? Well, it comes down to a characteristic of all personality disorders called lack of insight. Blame shifting, to some extent, is maintained because of a lack of insight. Sometimes we call lack of insight anosognosia. So I'm going to use a few examples from movies to demonstrate this point, so I want to issue a spoiler alert 
for A Few Good Men and for a movie called The Sixth Sense. So in the movie A Few Good Men, we see this character played by Jack Nicholson, Colonel Jessup, and there's this famous court scene at the end where he says to Tom Cruise's character, he says, you can't handle the truth. And I think this really tells us something about lack of insight. Essentially what you're saying there is that even if the truth were offered, it couldn't really be successfully processed. A lot of times this is what we think of when we think of narcissistic personality disorder. Even if somebody's confronted with the truth, because they're trying to protect a fragile ego, they can't handle that truth and they're going to move back to blame shifting and other cognitive distortions. Now moving over to that other movie, The Sixth Sense, we see here a mental health clinician played by Bruce Willis. The character's name was Malcolm Crow. We see that he's trying to help a boy who sees ghosts, who communicates with ghosts, and who, of course, is scared by them. And what, of course, we learn throughout the course of the movie at the end is that Malcolm Crow, this character, was dead for most of the movie. He, in fact, was a ghost. But he didn't see that he was a ghost, even though there was a lot of evidence there presented in the movie that he was. We saw that he didn't change clothes throughout the movie. We see that he was never driving a car. And we see that he never directly communicated with anybody but the boy. And, of course, he had all these cognitive distortions. He had blame shifting. He believed his wife was having an affair. And, of course, she wasn't because he had passed away and all the different circumstances and the dealings with the boy in terms of trying to help him, he didn't realize this whole time that he was a ghost. And the reason I like this movie as an example for lack of insight or honest agnosia is because most of the people watching the movie didn't realize it either. They didn't consider the possibility or that possibility never occurred to them. So it gives a little glimpse into what it's like to have lack of insight. Sometimes it's actually completely understandable that somebody would not have insight. Now, at the end of that movie, of course, the lack of insight dissipates very quickly, and Malcolm Crow, that character, realizes that he is a ghost. Of course, in clinical practice, this isn't what we see with a lack of insight. It's something that changes slowly, oftentimes two steps forward and one step back. So it's a process that takes time and patience on the part of the client and the clinician. So when working with blame shifting, if direct challenging doesn't always yield success, and pattern recognition doesn't always yield success, are there any other possible techniques? Well, one technique that mental health clinicians use, and they tend to use it the entire time throughout all therapy, in the context of blame shifting and in other contexts, would be to consider the nature of blame. In order to have blame shifting, somebody has to be blamed. And counselors use often a non-judgmental stance that takes out the blame and allows the client to focus on other areas instead of being defensive. Now I know whenever we get into the non-judgmental stance with counselors, I hear this argument about moral relativism, that counselors believe that nothing is good and nothing is bad. It doesn't really have anything to do with that. The idea here is that judgment in counseling simply is not successful. It shuts down the development of insight, and we believe that insight is crucial to reducing cognitive distortions. So the non-judgmental piece may be a core philosophy of counseling, but it's also a successful technique. And of course it doesn't mean that a counselor in their private lives don't make judgments about certain things. Everybody has to make judgments in their life about certain situations. It means that counselors don't judge clients. So they take the blame out of blame shifting. So I think that the non-judgmental stance, when combined sometimes with direct challenging and pattern recognition, can help. It can help somebody with a cluster B personality disorder to recognize blame shifting, to actually take responsibility and move past that cognitive distortion, to untangle it. Of course, sometimes, as I mentioned, the techniques don't work. I know that when we talk about cluster B personality disorders and cognitive distortions in particular, blame shifting, there are always going to be a great variety of opinions on this. People have seen blame shifting. They understand what may cause it, what may help somebody to move past it. If you have any thoughts on this, please leave those thoughts in the comments. As always, I hope you found this video on blame shifting and cluster B personality disorders to be interesting. Thanks for watching.